Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this live webinar that is being organised as part of the Veterinary Virtual Work Experience powered by us here at SpringPod. Now, whether you are just getting started with the programme or you might already be cracking on with it, firstly and probably most importantly, we do hope that you're enjoying it. But also, if you have any questions or you need to reach a member of our team for whatever reason, don't forget you can reach them using the green chat icon in the bottom right hand corner of your platform. Now, I know a lot of you webinar veterans will know exactly what's coming next but if you're brand new it's always handy to know the little housekeeping bits I'm about to go through. The talk will last half an hour. Don't forget to use your question and answers function um, to ask any questions that you have for our guest speaker today as I'm sure she would love to answer them and also she's here to help you so it's good to make use of the time. Now we do get a lot of questions in these sessions and we might not have chance to answer all of them and that's where your mm. upvote function comes in handy so if you see a question you think oh well, i want to ask that use the upvote function and we will try and pick out the most upvoted questions and ask those to our wonderful guest speaker and if you do need um to leave the webinar for whatever reason halfway through or you miss the webinar don't panic we have got you covered we're recording this session live and we aim to have that recording onto the relevant platform within the next 24 hours um and that's just so you can watch it back on demand now in today's webinar we are going to be talking about veterinary treatment and joining us to do just that is dr charlotte lloyd hi Hello, charlotte. everyone good morning to you all how um, are we doing Yes, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Thursday's actually my day off, so it's, oh. nice, it's nice to have a day off in the week. I do a four-day week, so um, yeah, it's nice. Well, thank you for joining us on your day off. Mm -hmm. And I know, you, I know you've got a really, really interesting presentation to show you, so I'm going to hand over to you and let you crack on with that. Perfect, thank you. So I'm just going to share um, a PowerPoint. Um... Have we? Oh, there we go. Just getting it up. There we go. Can you guys see that okay? Yes, sorry, Charlotte. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, you've got yeah that. sorry. <laughs> Okay, lovely. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I've just made um, a, a short presentation, just kind of a bit of an introduction into what a day in the life of a vet might be like. Um, some of you might have been lucky enough, you know, if you're if you're really interested in veterinary to have got some work experience or sort of physically in a vet. Um, but if you haven't, then I hope this will be sort of a good introduction. Um, so this is me, um, I'm Charlotte, uh, or Dr. Charlotte Lloyd professionally. Um, so I graduated only in June this year, so I'm still getting used to calling myself doctor. It's uh, very strange. Um, so yeah, I'm newly qualified, so I've just finished vet school. Um, it was my second degree, so I'm a mature student. Um, yeah, um, I'm just uh, starting work. So I started work in August um, and I'm based in Colchester in Essex. I'm a small animal vet. So that means dogs, cats, um, hamsters, guinea pigs, gerbils, all your small furries, birds, tortoises, chickens, um, but just none of the larger animals. You can specialise. You can either be a small animal vet or a large animal vet or an equine vet. Um, but yeah. So I look after our smallies. A um, bit more about me. Uh, these are my two fur babies. So Jinxie is my fluffy three-year-old rescue cat. Um, she's going to be four in January and we rescued her when she was six months old. So she's my, uh, yeah, she was my first sort of pet of my own. So she's my baby. Um, and then this is Hugo. He's two years old, just turned two, a little miniature white head dash and um, so yeah, they are my fur babies. Um, so today we are going to be sort of talking about a variety of things. I thought I'd start about just in case, you know, you guys were hoping to apply to vet school. Um, I've got a uh, veterinary sort of Instagram account um, and one of the things I get asked about a lot is sort of about you know applications to vet school, personal statements, um, the you know the best way to sort of present yourself in interviews and that sort of thing. 
So I thought I'd do a little bit firstly just about, you know, getting into vet school um, and then also my golden ticket piece of advice, which I wish someone had told me, you know, back before I was applying. So I thought I'd share that with you guys. Um, you know, a day in the life of a vet is, uh, is something I thought would also be really interesting for you guys, especially those that haven't seen, you know, practice sort of in real life um, physically. Um, so I've taken lots of photos. I literally did it of my day um, yesterday. So it is an honest opinion. It's literally what I do. Um, so hopefully that'll be interesting. And then I did um, a short video of how we carry out a physical exam. And then I think we've got some time at the end for a bit of a QA. and a um, so when you're thinking about sort of going to vet school, um, I would say you need to be another thing that people ask me say, oh, I'd, I'd quite like to be a vet, but I'm not sure. I would say you need to be 100 percent, you know, sure that it's what you want to do, because it's the hardest degree, I would say. They say it's harder than human medicine because we have to do exactly the same, you know, you know, all the body systems, but you have to do it for six different species. So not only do you have to remember everything that a doctor does, but six times over, you know, for all the different animals. So the main six species we're taught at vet school are um, dogs, cats, horses, cows, sheep and pigs. And then obviously we do do a little bit on birds and a little bit on the small furry. So, you know, your rabbits, ferrets, guinea pigs. We do a bit of that as well. So it's just a lot to remember. Not only is it sort of... Um, mentally demanding it's, you know it's physically demanding as well you know you've got a, you can see the from the photos here you've literally got to be happy to be wading you know through cow muck and uh, getting you know mucking out animals and um, lots of farm work so you know literally blood sweat and tears you have got to put into it so just make sure that you need to be you know really sure that it's what you want to do before you get into it um so before you apply you actually have to have so many weeks worth of work experience before you're even allowed to apply um so i went to the rvc which is the royal veterinary college in london and i, I checked their admissions page this week and currently they require 140 hours of um work experience so it's quite a lot um you know it's quite a lot to fit in before you can even apply i think a lot of people start kind of the year before the september october applications because lambing is an amazing one to do so i went lambing before i you know for my work experience to apply and then i went every year at vet school um so lambing is a really great one to do but anything you can do time in a vet practice you can do um you know stables farm kennels and cattery um just as much as you can do i think they say 140 hours is the minimum but so many people do a lot more than that um so yeah I'd just say you know you've got to think about being able to fit in your work experience before you can apply um, so a personal statement is one of the big ones for veterinary medicine applications, because when you apply, you've got your grades and, you know, if you're thinking about veterinary, you're probably going to have, you know, really good grades. You're going to be high achievers. You're going to be used to getting sort of those A's, A stars. And so will everyone else um, who's applying. So the only thing they really have to differentiate between the candidates is your personal statement, because that is the only thing which is a small reflection on you. So I'd say try and be as honest as possible and, and try and make yourself stand out. Don't be afraid to kind of big yourself up. And, you know, it's, it's the one time you've got literally when the admissions team will read it, you know, you get a few minutes. So um, and also my my big one tip is don't say you love animals because everyone of course you love animals because you're applying to be a vet so don't like that they don't like to read it um and they really like it when you give examples so for example you know you went lambing and oh i saw a potential problem this you was struggling to give birth and you know you weren't sure what to do which is fine because you know you're you know you're not you're not a vet yet but you know this is how i solved the problem this was the outcome they like it when you sort of explain situations and scenarios um and also they're really big on reflection so how did that scenario make you feel how do you think you tackle it differently next time that sort of thing is um you know kind of what they really like to read um, and also it doesn't have to all be about animals um 
obviously it probably the bulk of it will be because that is what being a vet is but you know do have you done any charity work do you play any hob you know do you play any sports hobbies that sort of thing um because sport teams and you know um the different committees and stuff at uni are you know also really a really big part of university and university life so if you play a sport they'd probably really like to um hear about that and different achievements too um if when you're applying to vet school you don't get in the first time round that's actually really common so many people in my year at um vet school when they applied they didn't actually i think you know it's not uncommon to take two or three times to get in so if you think oh i haven't got any offers this year or you know i didn't quite get the grades i think if it's something you want then you really just need to you know think I could take a bit of time out and then do a bit more work experience and then come back but yeah keep at it keep going and reapply sorry <coughs> um, and now for my golden ticket piece of advice which I wish someone had told me is if your A levels don't go well don't panic there's other routes into veterinary medicine. So for example, I wish someone had told me this because then I would have thought when I was 17, 18, I might not get into veterinary, you know, straight away to do the five year veterinary medicine course, <coughs> excuse me. But if I go and do a biology degree or an animal science degree and I get a two one, then that's a direct access into the four-year accelerated veterinary medicine course so if someone had told me that I probably would have gone about it that way and yes it will take a bit longer so instead of five five years you do the four years um accelerated course but you've obviously would have done your three-year bachelor's in your qualifying bachelor's degree before that so it will take a bit longer but if it's what you really want then that's a really common way for um, people to get into it. So I started vet school at 25 um, and I went in with a bachelor's degree and all my friends, there was about, I don't know, 10, 10 or so friends in my friendship group and we were all graduates and they'd all done the qualifying bachelor's degree route. So um, yeah, just, I wanted to say that to you because if you think, oh, I'm disheartened because I might not get the grades to go straight away then there's definitely still you know ways to get into it and ways to do it <clears throat> okay so this was just me yesterday taking photos of my day because i thought the best way to show you guys what it's like um is images so anyway my alarm goes off at 6 45 first thing i do is feed jinxie and hugo um they're always Jinxie's always scratching at the door and meowing so she's a great alarm clock um I leave the house at 8 20 um I'm really lucky I've got a very short commute to work so I often get to work about 8 30 and this is the small little practice that I work in so we're a practice there's five vets and I think seven nurses three or four receptionists um so it's, it's relatively small, but kind of small to medium size practice. Um, first thing I do when I get there is make a cup of tea round um, because that's what we need to get the day going. This um, is Luna. She is about an 18 month old cockapoo and she was in to be neutered yesterday. So um, she was very good, very sweet. Um, and then 9.30, so I've changed out of my consulting clothes and then I'm in my scrubs ready to pop into theatre. I wear crocs because crocs are life in veterinary medicine. It's you're in veterinary you're two types of people you either love crocs or you hate crocs but I love them because they're so comfortable. Um, so yeah ready to go into theatre so this is me in prep so 
the machine behind me is an anesthetic machine. Um, so the animals, once they're induced and then getting prepped on the table, um, they've got some oxygen sort of uh, being flowed by just to um, help them be stabilised under the anaesthetic. And then also we've got some of the anaesthetic gas there as well, which we can turn on to help um, get them ready and you know stable before they um, go into theatre. Um, so this is one of the nurses clipping Luna uh, ready for her spay. Um, so they have to make quite a big clip um, just so we've got room to make our incision. They do a big surgical scrub so the skin is decontaminated of any microbes. Um, so that's what they're doing there. This um, was me in theatre. So um, yeah, everything on the green drapes that you see. So that's a sterile field. Um, you can see some of the bloody swabs. So a bitch spay um, is what it's called when, you know, when when a female dog is neutered. Um, it's probably one of the most um, sort of difficult surgeries that we will do routinely um, as a general practitioner. And... Um, yeah, so it's quite a tricky surgery. So yeah, there's bloody swabs and um, clamps and it's quite a, you know, I'm quite focused. I'm not, um, you know, paying attention to the camera. But um, so yeah, that's during surgery. So I was in theatre for about two and a half hours. So you have to be able to concentrate for a long time. Um, and this is the uterus after I've removed it. Um, so at the top, um, you can see, uh, can, you see, can you guys see my mouse okay? Um, maybe you can, I'm not sure. I'll circle here if you can. So at the top, these are the ovaries in here. Then we've got um, the horns, the uterine horns, and then we go down. So kind of the, the single clamp at the bottom that's holding the cervix. So that's what we would call a routine ovario hysterectomy. Um, and that's um, how we, you know, spay a dog, a female dog. Um, so, yep, so that's what it looks like afterwards. And then this is the incision after I closed it up. So um, we do intradermals, which are sutures which just hold the skin together um, and they're nice and neat. Um, you don't have to, you know, don't, they don't have to come back to have sutures removed. And the, um, the suture material that we use is dissolvable. So. Once I've closed up, um, hopefully that should be that and it will heal nicely. Then we get to about one o'clock, lunchtime. Um, I wouldn't go into veterinary medicine if you always want a lunch break. Um, I actually got to sit down and eat food and I was like, oh, I'm going to take a photo of this because I don't often, um, you know, it's quite, quite common. I'll be sitting by my uh, computer stuffing a sandwich down and then making notes and being on the phone and so yeah um, it can be very busy and also you know you never know what's going to come in you could have emergencies um so yeah if you get lunch break you're lucky um by about three o'clock i'm consulting again so this is in one of the consult rooms um so i uh, co evening consults run from three o'clock till six o'clock this was one of my patients who was so cute um um I forgot his name, which is terrible, but he was a rag doll in for his booster. Um, and I just thought, oh, I've got to take a photo of that. He was a very good patient. He was a good boy. Um, this is a little friend that was on a puppy um, who had recently just been purchased by the owner and was scratching a lot, had lots of kind of bits that the owner could see in the coat. And then I took a flea comb and brushed it through. And um, so this is a mite, um, it's a chewing mite, which means um, the mites would live on the skin and uh, they live off bits of skin and skin cells and blood. Um, so yeah, not very nice, but so yeah, uh, veterinary is not glamorous. You have to be able to deal with gross things um so yeah i had to like brush the puppy through and get some of the mites off and um so yeah that was um we looked it under the microscope so this is a, obviously it's it's enlarged don't worry they're not they're not that big um and then just had some more cute patients in um this was um the owner had just rescued her so um she was in just for a health check um and her vaccinations 
um, and this was her sister, and they were both very cute. Um, they were really good as well. I mean, it's not all cuddling uh, puppies and kittens, but when you can, um, you need to take advantage of it because, um, you know, veterinary is one of those things. There's quite a lot of highs and lows. Um, it can be quite difficult mentally because you have to be able to go, say, for example, from this consultation, which was really lovely. They were really cute dogs, really cuddly, really friendly. But then my next appointment might be a euthanasia where I have to put someone's beloved Labrador to sleep, which is really sad. And, um, you know, it can take its toll sort of emotionally um, on vets. So that's something also to be aware of. Like you have to be able to deal with, you know, the great highs of veterinary, but also the sad times as well. Um, so normally by about 6, 6.30, I've finished consults and um, it's time to catch up with paperwork. I didn't actually have time to take a photo of me on the phone to clients. But um, so, yeah, normally I'm catching up with lab results, ringing owners, telling them results, um, yeah, dealing with paperwork, um, that sort of thing. And then normally by about 7.30, I'm home, um, back to Hugo. <laughs> He's either... Um, looked after by his dog walker or my husband for the day so he's not left on his own but um it's always nice to come back to a um yeah come back to um an animal that doesn't want treatment and just wants a cuddle so um yeah so that's my day really in a nutshell just a that's just one day um so it's always very varied um that's one of the great things about veterinary medicine i think your days will never be the same um you know one day you could be in theatre all day doing lots of operations. The next day you could be vaccinating a whole litter of kittens or, um, you know, in the afternoon you might have to go and do a home visit or, um, you know, to, to perhaps like an older um, owners that can't come to the vets. Um, so, yeah, it's really, really varied. Um, it's obviously what I think is the best job in the world. Otherwise, I wouldn't have, you know, spent so much time at uni and retrained because, you know, it was my second degree. But anyway, um, so I yesterday I quickly filmed a video for you guys just um, to show you sort of how I'd carry out a quick health check. So health checks are really important. Whenever we have any animal come in, that would be the first thing we do, you know, especially when you're triaging a, a patient in an emergency. The first thing you're going to do is carry out a basic health check because it can really tell you um it can tell you a lot um and also we do it at every booster um you know just to see monitor that animal yearly and just see how they're getting on so hopefully fingers crossed with our technology this will work go Okay, so we've got the lovely Hester here, and I'm just going to show you guys how to do a quick health check. All right, we are. So one of the first things we want to do is just make sure that their eyes, nose and ears are clear. They will look nice and clear, no discharge from the nose. Ears look good. Well done, well done, sweet. Um, and then the next thing I usually do, so I always do a sort of nose to tail approach. Um, so the next thing I would do would be to check her teepee pace. Can I look at your teepee, please? Good. <laughs> well done. On this side. Brave girl. Good. So the next thing I do is you want to have a good feel sort of along the body and I'm feeling to see if um, any lymph nodes are enlarged, um, just to see if I can feel any lumps or bumps anywhere. And then usually at this point as I work my way back, um, I'll feel the abdomen to see, um, you know, how patient is she comfortable? Does she have any pain at all? Is it tense? Is it firm? Is she bloated? Um, we can also sometimes feel if there's any organ enlargement. Um, yes, yeah, so it can tell us quite a lot by feeling the tummy, but Hester here feels nice and comfortable on your belly, don't be sweet. Good girl. Okay, so the next thing I'd usually do is have a listen to the um, lungs and the heart. <laughs> Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. And that's all sounding really lovely. Um, so on a puppy like Kester, we'd be listening for 
for things such as murmurs, um, which can be congenital, so they can be born with it. Um, but equally, in any age of dog, it's really important that we listen to their heart every year at that annual health check. Um, you know, again, just to listen to the health of the heart and to see if we have any murmurs or arrhythmias developing. Um, so yeah, always good to have a listen to the heart. And um, we would also listen to the chest as well, just to make sure that the lungs sound normal and that there's no crackles or wheezing. Um, and we'd also ask the um, owner if there's any coughs or sneezes, um, you know, to also think about the respiratory system. Um, so this is a pretty much nose to tail health check um, that we would do on a puppy. Um, we would also, when checking in the mouth, when looking at the teeth, we'd open up to see if there was a cleft palate. Um, it's what we look for in a puppy. Um, but Hester doesn't have one of those either. Um, also, if we hadn't seen um, a puppy before, we'd check um, their gender just to make sure if they have testicles present and just to make sure that two had descended um, and just to make sure the owners um, bought the right sex. Um, but yeah, uh, oh, another thing we do, which we should never forget on health check, is to wait on the pictures. Okay, sweet. Got two on there. These are actually my cat tails. You go on there. Good girl. <laughs> Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Oh, you're 3.9. Oh, you're four. You're a big girl. Big girl. Well done. Well done, Hester. And that would conclude a basic health check. Okay, so I hope you guys could all see that and hear that and found that um, interesting. Um, but yeah, that brings us to the end of the presentation. So thank you all for listening. I hope that was useful and you guys can take something from that. Um, but yeah, um, oh, I also, I'd do a little plug. Uh, if you guys haven't seen me on Instagram and you want to see some more like veterinary um, day in the life of the vet or interesting cases, then please um, uh, have a look and follow me on there. But yeah, that is everything. So um, I'd like to see if you guys have any questions. Thank you so much, Charlotte. That was so interesting. And it was a lovely insight onto a day-to-day -day life of uh, a vet and also seeing some of the treatments that you have to carry out on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Now, we've had questions coming in already. And the first, I think, is touching on what you were saying at the beginning with regards to qualifications. And it's a question you're saying, do we need four A-levels or are three enough as they feel like they might be overwhelmed with the four? Yeah, definitely. So I'm just gonna, sorry, I'm just gonna try and get back to the spring pod page. Here we go. Lovely. Um, yeah, so I definitely say four A levels is a lot. Um, so when I was applying, um, we would do normally four ASs, um, then drop one and then just do the three A levels. And I looked on the um, RVC admissions page this week just to check out the work experience and I'm still pretty sure they only um, they only require three. Thank you and I know you said that obviously it's quite hard to stand out because everyone's going for the same thing so with your personal statement do you think there are any veterinary study books that you would recommend in order to aid standing out? So I would say I was the same I think because you know when we go into veterinary we're we're keen beans, like we're really, you know, that's what we, that's all we want. And, you know, I I was the same, but I would say, I, I asked my, like, I knew a vet and I said exactly the same, can I buy any books or anything? But I would say, try not to stress about it too much and just um, focus more on your sort of personal attributes. I wouldn't say you need any sort of scientific, mm -hmm. like veterinary knowledge to start with. Um, I mean, of course, anything that's going to help stand you out. I think I use the buzzword dystocia in my personal statement, which just means uh, trouble um, when giving birth. Um, and perhaps they like that. I don't know. But yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about it. I'd just more focus on sort of you personally. Thank you, Charlotte. And how often would you say that you have to treat animals by surgery on a day to day basis? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, as, when you qualify as a vet in the UK, you actually qualify as a veterinary surgeon. So all vets in the UK will be qualified to do surgery. And um, normally you you choose you're either you either like the medicine route, which is more, you know, your day to day 
kind of being a GP, that sort of thing, or you do surgery, which is I want to be a surgeon. Um, and there's always a natural flow to which one you lean to. Um, but most vets will have one or two surgery mornings a week. And then the rest of the time they'll be consulting unless you choose I only want to do medicine or I only want to do surgery. Um, personally, I really like surgery. Um, so I want to do as much of that as possible. But um, yeah, I'd say you do a bit of both. Thank you. And um, Charlotte, could, this is a really, this one I like. Could you take a pet with you to university? <laughs> I love that question. I know. So everyone said that to us. They're like, but you're at vet school. Why can't you take your dogs to lectures? Yeah. With you? <laughs> I, I think if I ran a vet school, I would say you could bring your pet, but you can't because if everyone took their pet, there was 300 people in my lecture hall. It would be crazy. So, um, and then normally in the halls of residence, again, they wouldn't let you. Yeah. But once you get you know, further through the course, and then you're in sort of private rented accommodation. Some people did have dogs and cats, but I would err on the side of caution just because we're, when you're in vet school, your your timetable is ridiculous. Yeah. You will be doing 12 hour shifts over like, in, like one of the shift patterns was 4 p.m. till 4 a.m. Oh, wow. Like when we were in, on our emergency um, rotation. So you can't leave the dog and, you know, so yeah. I'd, I'd say, not really because you just don't you just don't have the time thank you it's, it's such a lovely question though. I, know, I wish you could i know and our final question charlotte is in university to be a veterinary surgeon which course do you take do you take veterinary science or veterinary medicine so they're the same thing okay <laughs> Um, every university so there's only um that's why it's so hard to get into veterinary as well because there's only a limited number of universities that will offer veterinary science or medicine um but yeah so rvc is bachelor of veterinary medicine where i think i don't know nottingham they might call it um veterinary science um so if ever you're unsure about like which course is what or what your entry requirements need to be, then go on each of the university's admissions pages because they and they also change what they're looking for sometimes. Mm -hmm. So make sure you're always kind of looking back to make sure you're doing the right courses to apply. So, um, yeah, mostly science and medicine is the same. I know I said that was the last question, Charlotte, but what <laughs> at the last, the actual last question is what is the most interesting animal that you have treated? I think it's such an interesting Ooh, question. Oh, that's a good question. The most interesting animal. So on my rotation, um, uh, in my, so my last year of vet school, I had to help with a um, marmoset monkey. Oh, um, it's like a teeny tiny, it's literally about this big. It's the tiniest, and someone had it as a pet. Um, so I was down in London and they brought it in and yeah, it wasn't very well, so it needed some treatment. And but yeah, so that was incredible. I've never even wow. seen one before. So to be able to work with one close up, yeah, it was amazing. Well, thank you so much, Charlotte. Again, thank You're you welcome. for just giving us such an interesting insight into a day in the life of the vet, which I think everyone always wants to know anyway, and to see the pictures there as well. Yeah. Um, and just for anyone who's missed it, what was your Instagram handle again? Um, so uh, it used to be um, Vet School Diaries, but obviously now I've graduated, I felt like I had to change it. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> vet Surgeon Diaries. So if anyone thank wants you. to come over and give us a follow, then you'll see loads more veterinary stuff. Well, I'm going to follow, and I'm not a vet student, but I'm just, <laughs> yeah, I'm just uh, love animals. People do yeah. that. So. But um, again, thank you so much for joining us and taking my pleasure. And I hope that was useful to some of you. Yeah, I think it was exceptionally useful. And again, thank you for taking time out of your day off to come and see no us. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and thanks to everyone who was asking the questions as well. Now, just a reminder. Please don't forget to get all of your work submitted and get the programme completed by the 12th of November. That's just so that you're eligible for your certificate. But you can find all of those important dates back in module one if you need reminding. Good luck with the rest of your programme. Thank you again to the wonderful Dr. Charles Lloyd and we'll see you all very soon.